Welcome to Dynavap Live. Today is June 19th, or no, 18th, and it is 4.19 p.m. I'm joined by George, the founder of Dynavap and Automation Pranav. And so, Pranav, let's uh, see who's watching and where they're from. Well, I'm in deep space, but let's give out some shout outs. We have Shane in Arkansas, Dams in Belgium and Poland. He's in two places at once. So he's a uh, superposition? Yeah, must be an electron. We have Marco from Italy, Neal Burns from Illinois, Jason Davis from Oklahoma. <laughs> I want to be there. <laughs> Russ Boyd from California, Daz from UK, a record guy from Indiana, George from Missouri, and Kyle from Alabama. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Nice. Yes, and we want to thank you all for tuning in. And if this is your first time watching, just to give you a little uh, intro, uh, we are Dynavap. We manufacture battery-free vaporizers. And if you haven't used our product, this is going to be a perfect introduction video for you because we're going to be going over a lot of heating tips and live demonstrations to best showcase how to utilize the product. And Pranav, what's going on over in Instagram right now? Oh, we've been having a lot of giveaways and we've had the summer solstice giveaway going on. That's six days of giveaways. It's day four right now. And this time we're picking the winner from the YouTube live chat. So send us some interesting comments or questions and you stand a chance to win a wakeboard, a 2020M and a cool Dynastash. Good luck. All right. So get your VapCap heating questions ready. Pranav is monitoring the chat from deep space. <laughs> and if you haven't subscribed already, I highly recommend you do so and ring the bell so that way you're notified whenever we release new videos. That way you're never out of the loop and you can always get the best tips and tricks delivered right to your YouTube channel uh, without missing a beat. And uh, Pranav, what's going on with the different parts of the community right now? Oh uh, yeah, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone in the Dynaverse, especially the Dynaverse Discord. So. Thank you guys for joining in. If you guys are interested, I will post a link for the invite and you guys can hop on. We'll, we'll be having some cool, interesting conversations and we're looking to grow uh, this community. Also, would like to thank uh, FC Forum, Vapor Asylum, uh, subreddits, Dynavap, Vaporins. Uh, am I missing anyone, Josh? I uh, know. I think you just about covered them all. Awesome. Uh, but speaking of that community, that's so important to us. It, allow, it has what allowed us to grow as much as we have in the past year. And we really want to stress that as much as we can. Uh, it's so important. And every time we do a new uh, stream, we ask a question, whether it be on Twitter or on the YouTube community channel, uh, just to kind of get a little insight as to what's important to you. So this week we asked, what aspect is most important to you in a torch? Uh, the options were number of jets, reliability, portability or size, design, and other. And the clear winner was reliability. Now, George, why do you think that is? Well, I thought the clear winner was other. <laughs> but uh, no, I think reliability is a huge thing because when your torch doesn't work, well, that's kind of annoying. But I guess the good news is, as you may have seen in some of our uh, previous videos and the one we just released on Monday, you still have other options. It's kind of a nice thing. Yep, and speaking of other options too, our products aren't only available on Dynavap.com. They're available on and many retail stores around the world. It's a growing list currently, and we would love your help, wouldn't we, George? We would. So uh, please patronize the local retailers, whether they're online or brick and mortar stores. You know, the online stores that might be closer to you or maybe in the country that you live in or somewhere that's more nearby. It makes the uh, delivery times shorter. It simplifies the customs and duty experience and it supports these small businesses, which really nice thing. Uh, we appreciate it, they appreciate it, good for everybody. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have your local store that's carrying our product, we'd really appreciate your help in asking them to carry our product. It means so much more to a store owner when the customers ask for a product than when we approach a store and ask them if they'd like to carry our product. Yeah, the will of the people is such an important thing. And speaking of like new stores, our sales dude Jeff is going to be showcasing two new stores that have just been added to our uh, growing list, and he's going to talk about those right now. Hello, and welcome to Dynavap Live's Wholesale Spotlight. I'm Jeff Alexander, sales dude with Dynavap. Today we'll be talking about new wholesale accounts as well as two featured accounts. This past month, we've onboarded over 30 new shops. This includes brick and mortar shops, 
as well as authorized resellers and or e-commerce shops. And on to our two featured accounts of the month. Upper Limits Midwest, based in Springfield, Illinois. John and team have a very neat smoke and vape shop. They came up with a nice COVID-19 solution where their customers would order product online and pick it up through the drive-through. For our second featured location, Donna is on location in Appleton at eVapor. Hey, it's fun Donna. We're here in Appleton, Wisconsin. I'm here with Sean. Hi, I own eVapor of Appleton and I took DynaVap in for sale now in my stores. And my store is in 2929 North Richmond Street, Appleton, Wisconsin, and I have a second location at 1725 South Oneida Street in Appleton, Wisconsin. We took in this product, we are having a great time, it's selling good, and everybody should have it in their store. So, there we are, that's me. Yeah, Back there. to you guys. Yeah, yeah. That's been this week's Wholesale Spotlight. If you have a shop you'd like featured in your area, please send the information to jeff at dynavap.com. Thank you for joining us. And so those are two new stores that we have there. Now, yes. George, here's the uh, where to buy feature. Now, this is something that is very important, isn't it? It is, and, and this is right on our website. So what you see scrolling here, you can go to our website and you can find this information. This is our, as current as we can keep it list of our retailers. It's a growing list. We hope to keep it growing. We hope that you'll be willing to join us in helping it grow by asking your local retailers to carry our product. And, you know, please do support these businesses. Uh, I'm sure they really appreciate it. Yeah, I think one of the uh, biggest benefits, especially if you're an international customer, it's a way that you can save on shipping, save on duty, and being able to support your local economy as well. And I think now is a good opportunity to kind of go right into the main subject, and that's going to be the heating tips. Uh, now, because we're going to be focusing on heating tips at beginners and the advanced users alike, George, what is your favorite heating tip that you, or best advice that you can give to a new customer? Slow down. I, I don't know how better to say it, but just slow down. Don't try and rush so much. Give yourself a little bit more space between your heat source and your device. Okay? What this allows for, it allows for a less intense temperature at your cap, and it allows for more diffused heating, which is going to give you more uniform heat throughout your extraction chamber and an overall more satisfying experience. Definitely agree. And what about you, Pranav? Uh, I've been using the induction a lot of late, and I think the tip I could give is try pulsing, slowing it down, like George said. Uh, heat it for a couple of seconds, let go, heat it again, and you'd find really amazing results. So give that a shot. And so you both kind of uh, mentioned some of my favorite heating tips. And so my favorite heating tips are going to be displayed in this week's episode of The Snap, a segment where we answer frequently asked questions. So take it away, Ben. Welcome to The Snap. This is a segment where we answer frequently asked questions in a very rapid fire format. So let's get right into it. On this week's episode of The Snap, we are going to be discussing heating tips and techniques for your 2020 M. We're going to show you how to get those dense vapor clouds with either an induction heater or a triple jet torch. The easiest way to remember how to get the best performance out of any product is to heat the tip for a tasty rip, heat the base to launch a space. Heating the tip is going to be the area closest to the end of the cap, right near the crimp. This is going to give you a more flavorful draw filled with all those tasty terpenes. Where heating the base is going to give you a higher temperature, denser, more potent cloud of vapor if that's what you're after. I'll be using a triple torch today and I'm going to show you how to best focus the jets to get the best performance. Rotation. There are two trains of thought, either the infinite spin or the back and forth. For beginners, I recommend using the infinite spin as it's going to allow for more even heating consistently. To do that, simply take your device between your index finger and thumb and rotate in one continuous direction, either clockwise or counterclockwise, whichever works best for you. This is going to give really even heating at the same consistent height to allow the most consistent performance with your device. The next step in understanding how to get the best performance out of your 2020M is jet placement on your cap. If you look at the torch, I have two jets at the bottom, one at the top. That's a standard configuration for a cluster triple torch. You're going to want to take those two jets and aim them at the base of the cap, like so, and then rotate. That is going to give you a really nice, even high temperature and going to enable those dense, potent vapor clouds. 
Make sure you take note of the distance between the jets and the cap itself. You want to be above it, like roasting a marshmallow. You do not want to bury the cap right in the flame as it's going to end up scorching the material and not leading to a good experience. Slower is better, especially if you're looking for those dense clouds. It is completely normal for your first heating cycle with fresh material to not provide extremely dense vapor. That is because the heat of the tip hasn't been soaked in all the way. Upon consecutive heating cycles, you'll enable denser vapor. To do that, take your draw as normal, and then once the cool down click occurs, immediately heat it up for another heating cycle and it'll provide that dense vapor that you're looking after. Now when using an induction heater with your 2020M, make sure you load it up with ground material and press down to initiate the heating sequence. And you'll pulse it, press it down for a few seconds and let go. You'll just repeat that process until you hear a click. This will allow the heat to fully soak into the tip, giving you the densest possible vapor. You'll wanna make sure that it is plugged in and turned on, otherwise you won't hear that click. Then take your draw and repeat as many times as necessary. If the pulse method isn't giving you dense enough vapor, Try skipping a heat cycle. Press down, heat till the click, except this time you will not take any draw. Once the cool down click occurs, immediately take your device and put it right back into the induction heater and heat till a subsequent click. This will give you the densest vapor for certain. Let us know what you thought about this episode in the comments below. And what would you like featured on the next episode? Heat the tip for a tasty rip, or heat the base to launch a space. Hey there, and so as we discussed in the previous video where I showcased the triple torch, if you're using a single torch such as the Javelin, you're going to have to expect it to take a little bit longer due to the slower heat up time. Now George, you mentioned it takes longer for the heat to soak into the stainless steel tip, correct? Not just soak in. The stainless steel tip has more mass, so it takes longer to heat up, whether you're using a triple flame torch or a single flame torch, because there's simply more mass there to heat up. This can be a very good thing under the circumstances that uh, maybe it's cold outside, the wind's blowing, you want to have a little bit more thermal mass there to keep things at operational temperatures a little bit longer. But if you're just looking for a quick, fast extraction, and uh, a very small microdose, maybe the titanium tip is the better fit. And this torch is running out of fuel there, but you can see I was running that for probably about 15 seconds and still did not get the click. And so it's going to take a little bit longer. And if you found that video helpful, I highly recommend uh, checking out the Dynablog on the website where it's gonna recap this episode of the Snap as well as many previous heating tips that we've done. It's gonna be a great resource for those new customers out there. So if you have any questions, I highly recommend checking that out and that can be found on dynavap.com under the About section. Right. And I think now's a good time to take some questions. Uh, Pranav, what are some of the uh, good questions that you're seeing out we there? We have a lot of questions and I'd like to start off with this one. So someone asked if Heating the VAP cap in a microwave is a good idea, and that's an excellent question. Uh, I guess we can start off with trying to understand how a microwave works. So the microwave has a magnetron that zaps electrons, and what these electrons do, oh sorry, microwaves, and the water molecules in your food will absorb the microwaves and this causes the water molecules to vibrate and the friction of those vibrations is what causes your food to heat up. So what happens when you put a metal inside your microwave? I guess I'll hand it over to George and I guess he can give us a better explanation. Oh, thank you for that Pranav. You might get sparks. <laughs> I'll just keep it simple. Uh, don't use a microwave to heat up uh, your VAP cap. But just to maybe prove the point, we might have to give that a shot. Yes, so I think so we, we're going to get a microwave and yeah. heat up a VAP cap. So if you've got a microwave science. that's really been bothering you that you would like us to uh, maybe get even with, let us know and maybe we'll get even with your microwave. We'll take it off your hands gladly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're really kind of cool if you've ever taken one apart, you know, just seeing what's inside of the magnetron itself, which is what generates the microwave energy. It's actually a vacuum tube. Uh, 
not a whole lot different than the vacuum tubes in the really awesome high quality amplifiers from back in the day. It's just uh, more all metal construction and some really interesting materials in there, how it's all put together uh, with the, uh, the, the, the copper, I think it's the copper cathode and uh, tungsten uh, anode in there uh, with the uh, electrons bouncing back and forth inside uh, a relatively high vacuum. <laughs> and what other questions do we have, Pranav? Uh, is it possible to heat my DanaVap in the bowl of another vaporizer, like the Planet of the Vapes 1, for instance? I think that's a perfect one for you, George. Uh, well, the answer is generally yes. And there are other vaporizers that also work well for heating a vap cap. I think it's just one of those really nice ancillary benefits of having a vaporizer that is energy source independent. And I think it's just one of the unique features that uh, the vap cap has. I'm pretty sure it's one of the only vaporizers that can be heated by another vaporizer. <laughs> <laughs> how long will it take to, or how long will it take a light bulb to click a cap? It depends on the light bulb. It depends on the light bulb. Uh, the halogen light bulbs tend to get really, really hot, uh, especially like the 500 watt halogen work lights, which you don't see as often anymore because the LEDs are becoming more common, but those halogen bulbs produce a whole lot of heat. And if you hold your VAP cap close to there, you know, as long as you've got enough thermal intensity, you can get things to click pretty quickly. That's a, that's a good question though. It's, it's another kind of fun thing. You know, what, what's the difference between a halogen light bulb and the sun in a magnifying glass? Well, the answer is just a little bit of uh, intensity depending on your focus. I like this question. So does spinning the cap faster affect the process in any way? I think it does. I, I agree. And in fact, uh, if you want to spin it really fast, you can chuck it in a drill and spin it as fast as the drill will go while you hold your torch next to it. And what you're going to find is you're going to get a very, very even consistent heat because you're not holding your extraction chamber in the same place relative to that flame for very long at all. So it gives you a much better distribution and diffusion of your heat. Mm -hmm. That's why I like the infinite spin uh, technique and why I particularly like the hydrovong. I find that I'm able to get a faster rotation, yeah. which means that my material is more consistently roasted. And you know, I think the hydrovong really contributes to being able to rotate the device a little bit more easily. It's got a little bit more of a tactile mm -hmm. design and shape to it. A little bit larger diameter, so it's a little bit easier to grip. And we tried to emulate that to a degree with the uh, 2020M. You know, it's got a much more pronounced grip than any device we've made to date. Mm -hmm. And it's great too, like if you're outside and you may be a little, your hands might be a little bit sweaty, you can have a little bit more secure grip. And then, uh, can I use a torch to clean a CCD? You can, but I wouldn't generally recommend it. Uh, so the CCD, or the circumferential compression diffuser, uh, some people call them screens, <laughs> uh, provides a, an interesting function in terms of it filters some of the dry media from the vapor that's being produced when it's heated. But it also functions to hold itself in place, uh, because when you push it into place, it forms an arch. So it can resist force to a certain degree from one direction, but then pops out of place and can be repositioned uh, relatively easily using the condenser or another similar round tool. When you heat these things up, especially if you make them glow with a torch, what you're going to do is you're going to modify the crystalline structure of the metal. In other words, you're going to anneal it. So some of the springiness that we try really, really hard to engineer into that device is then lost. So not saying you can't do it. Is it an effective way to clean it? The answer is yes, but it may not go back into position quite as easily or it may not stay there as well as if you don't. I also find too, like when I've dealt with customers that um, most of the time when I see ones that have like shattered or broken, mm -hmm. they've uh, tried to clean it via heat. Is that uh, pretty standard for the course? Well, it's just one of those things that if you've ever bent wire back and forth until it breaks, it's just one of those things that the more we fatigue a metal, the more likely we are to cause problems, to cause stress fractures, and to cause not only deformation, but breakage. Uh, so not saying that you don't need to take the CCDs out to clean, but the reality is you don't need to always take them out. And 
the less you mess with them, the longer they're going to last. Yeah, Pranav, this is a question that I have for you. How often do you actually remove the CCD when you clean your device? Uh, it depends. So once it gets gunked up and I see visually that it is gunked up, that's when I take it out, brush it off, and put it back in. I don't replace them that often, but just a quick rub usually solves the problem. Yeah, I, ver I think I've only had to replace one in the two years that I've had mine. Wow, only one. Yeah. Now, do you ever soak yours in any hot liquids? Yes. <laughs> yep. So another thing to think about is that, you know, instead of taking your screen out, you can use uh, one of the alternative cleaning methods that we've talked about in the past. Mm -hmm. You soak your tip and maybe other components of your device in a hot liquid with some homogenized fat, and you'd be surprised at how well that can clean your device. And it's a nice, enjoyable experience afterwards. And uh, Pranav, what other questions do we have? Uh, will the car lighter work for a heat source? You know, it's been a while since we've tried that, but yes, Probably it will work. It might take a couple of tries, but uh, uh, if we're talking about the old school cigarette lighter that you push in and it pops out when it's at temperature, uh, just uh, do that and hold that glowing part right on your cap and kind of rotate around a little bit, get some heat transfer. It can be done. All we need is enough thermal intensity to get things up to vaporizing temperature, and you can get that cap to click. Not unlike the electric stove that was showcased in the Exploring the Dynaverse episode. I think that's a very good comparison. When do you think is the end of life of a cap? Mm. I would say the most common end of life of a cap is when you don't know where it is. <laughs> <laughs> I the, would agree. The second most <laughs> common end of life of a cap is after you step on it. Uh, I've heard of people running them over, and the fun thing is, if you run over your cap, well, as long as the cap is on the tip, it'll probably be okay. But if you run it over without any support inside, you know, it can be kind of a, a crushing thing. Yeah, you get cap pancake. Right. And I guess that would bring us to cleaning caps. I know we don't recommend dropping caps in soap solutions. Would you like, right. like to elaborate? So. We don't recommend soaking caps, especially in soapy solutions, because you can get a little bit of that solution and some of that soap mm -hmm. can get into some of the crevices inside of your cap and can leave a residual flavor profile that's not exactly appealing. Yeah, if you're going to, you'd want to make sure that it's very, A, only do it if it's extremely dirty, and B, if it's a very mild, unscented detergent. Right, well, I still don't even recommend soap for the cap. For, for the rest of the parts, which can be completely accessed, and cleaned and brushed and pipe cleaners, whatever else, put them in the dishwasher, it's okay. But the cap, again, because we've got areas that are just inaccessible for mechanical cleaning, don't use anything that doesn't completely evaporate. Okay, so uh, various cleaning solutions and solvents like isopropyl alcohol or even ethanol are actually good choices. You just generally don't want to soak your cap in these solutions for extended periods of time. Ideally, you use a cotton swab or something like that, and you just dip the end and you wipe the inside out. And that way we're not encouraging that liquid to motivate other things to get underneath the temperature indicators or go into a crack or a crevice where you just can't get to it. And you're not soaking the cap, which a lot of these substances, like especially isopropyl alcohol or ethanol, they're actually rather corrosive. And even though the caps are made from stainless steel, when they've been repeatedly heated and torched, it changes the, the chemical structure a little bit of that stainless steel. And when exposed to a corrosive liquid like alcohol for an extended period of time, you don't necessarily get rust, but you can get some pitting and some other discoloration. Generally, it doesn't hurt the function of the cap, but it can change the way it looks. And if that's going to bother you, well, don't do that. Now, I have a question for you, George. If a customer uh, accidentally combusts and they've gotten some ash inside their cap, what's the best way to clean that? I really think a cotton swab and a little cleaning solution is the best under almost all circumstances. And, and the good news is, also, our devices are very, very modular. And there really isn't a single component of the device that's expensive. You know, they may not be low cost or cheap, but they're not terribly expensive. And I would also say that our devices are probably some of the most user serviceable devices on the market. So if you tend to damage, lose, or uh, temporarily misplaced, or you know what, you find someone that needs an extra part and you just give them one of yours, parts are easy to come by and they're easy to service and easy to replace. Yeah, I've spent some significant money on proprietary batteries for 
certain things throughout the years, and you know it's definitely more expensive to do that than replacing a cap if I step on it. Right, or or if you get it really dirty and it just doesn't smell real good. Uh, other things that can be done uh, is if your cap just has a, an odor that you just can't seem to get rid of, you can try putting it in your oven the next time you bake something and just leave it in there. Let it be hot for a long time and it can help drive off some of those residual odors and flavors. Great answer. And what else do we have, Pranav? Um, let's see here. Someone asked why the cap changes colors when, when you heat them. That's a, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. And it's not a lot different than why does titanium change colors when it gets hot? And or how do we get the different colors in titanium uh, by anodizing, which is just creating uh, an oxide layer of an adjustable and variable thickness. Okay. So as we heat the cap, what we're doing is we're encouraging various different molecules of the alloy of that stainless steel to oxidize. And as we get it hotter, we can create a different thickness of that oxide layer, which then changes the way that the light interacts with the reflective surface of the metal underneath. Therefore, changing the color that we perceive coming off that reflective metal underneath, uh, coming through that layer of metallic oxide. Just like how you heat treated the CVAPs. Just like how we heat treated the CVAPs. Selective oxidation. And what else do we have, Pranav? Does different or less pure butane cause the cap to become discolored more? In general, no. Uh, the biggest issue with the less pure butane uh, has less to do with the cap than it has to do with the orifice in your lighter. Uh, so we kind of got into that on our Exploring the Dynaverse episode a little over a month ago uh, where we took apart a lighter and kind of showed some of the components. So if you haven't seen that, uh, you can find that on our YouTube channel. Uh, but uh, there's a tiny, tiny, tiny little hole in there. And if you have butane that's not nice and clean and pure, and not just the butane in the can, but the fill nozzle on the butane tank and the fill nozzle on the bottom of your lighter, if there's dirt and other contamination in there before you go and fill it, you want to do your best to kind of blow that off and clean it off because otherwise when you go to put that fuel in your lighter, you're pushing all of that contamination right into your fuel tank and you're just asking for problems. Yeah, to kind of bring it back around that community uh, question that we asked earlier, uh, you know, reliability, you can have the most reliable torch in the world if you yes. put really poor quality butane in, it's not going to last very long. Yeah. You put gasoline in your diesel powered car, it's not going to last real long. It's just, just what it is. You know, so in the end, knowing a little bit about the equipment that you're using and what makes it happy and what makes it sad, well, this information will help you make better choices to keep that equipment happy longer. This is a good question for you, Josh. Uh, why do we recommend triple flame for beginners? Uh, the reason why we recommend triple flames for beginners is due to the heat being more spread out across the cap rather than in one pinpoint location. Uh, when your technique isn't quite there yet and it's not as established and you're focusing that pinpoint precision heat on one area of the cap, you're going to create hot spots inside the extraction chamber. That's going to increase your likelihood of combustion, which isn't a good time when you're trying to vaporize your product rather than combust. And so I highly recommend getting familiar with a triple torch first, establishing that technique. It's like doggy paddling in a pool before you uh, start swimming like you normally would. It's practicing and getting that technique established before you go full bore with the single torch. I completely agree with that. And the other thing I would really strongly encourage is slow down and back off. Okay? You don't need the visible part of the flame to touch the cap. It's just not necessary for good heat transfer. There's a stream of very hot gas coming off the tips of these flames that are completely enveloping the extraction chamber on our device. Even if it's two inches above the flame, you still get a significant amount of heat transfer. And that triple torch also makes it really easy for a person that doesn't have the best technique or the best aim to still get a good portion of that hot gas to envelop that cap, get good heat transfer, and end up with good results right out the gate. Yeah, it's like baking in an oven. It's not coming in direct contact with that heating element. It's you don't need direct contact. Yeah. 
The, in fact, the direct contact is probably the number one cause of people getting unsatisfactory results because <laughs> now we're, we're creating too much of a temperature differential and we're getting the hot spots. We're getting one small little part of the extraction chamber of the cap way too hot. <laughs> and even if we're not initiating combustion, we might be getting some of the material inside of our extraction chamber, we'll say above the sweet temperature. And even if we're not burning it, we might be creating some flavors that are just simply less desirable. And it also can affect the long-term reliability of the cap, is that correct as well? Uh, if you make your cap glow, you tend to throw off the calibration of the temperature indicator. So it's, it's really encouraged to slow down, space it out a little bit, okay? take your time, you're going to get better results. Mm -hmm. And as you get a little more familiar with your device and your heat source, well, then you can start to push it a little bit more. It's kind of like riding a bike. You know, it's, it's a technique. It takes a little while to learn, to get comfortable, to get familiar with it. And as you get more familiar with it, you understand the nuance. You understand how you can push the limits a little bit more comfortably without crashing and sliding down the hill. Yeah, um, one way that I kind of see it too is, you c and I think a lot of people try to heat it really fast because they think they're going to get more vapor. In mm -hmm. actuality, you're going to spend six seconds heating it twice because you've got two garbage draws when you could just spend the 15 seconds and get one really awesome draw for your device. And it, it, preference. It, it really is. And I think the other part of this that sometimes just tends to get missed okay, is the heating of the device is a really important part of the process to really kind of prepare yourself for what's happening next. So focus on it and enjoy that part of the experience for what it has to offer. Mm -hmm. And a great way to kind of uh, better understand how to get to know your cap, I recommend checking out on the YouTube channel the Getting to Know Your Cap Snap video, as that will kind of prime you uh, and help you practice and establish that technique with your new device. Which, by all means, heat it up empty. Mm -hmm. Heat it until it clicks, put on the magnet, just wait, hold it in your fingers, practice that spin and that rotation until it cools down. Get familiar with heating until a click and waiting for the cool down click so you can kind of get your mind into about what the expected rhythm is, about what the click not only sounds like, but what it feels like. And it's, it's one of these really useful things is you can train your fingertips to feel something that you may not even realize is there because even though that click is not very loud, it still makes a tactile vibration that if you really think about it and focus and pay attention to it, you can train your fingertips to feel it so that even in very, very loud environments, even with headphones on, uh, you can still feel that click. That's a great thing to mention is wait, try to find that tactile response. Oh, and, and I, I think it's really important. The devices that we manufacture are, are very tactile devices, intentionally. And we feel uh, that the, the tactile indicator is one of the best ways of communicating with, uh, you know, between the device and the operator of that device. Okay. It's, 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 it's so almost intuitive mm -hmm. that once you get that feel for it, you just simply know. Uh, another way I can describe it for anyone that has ever driven a car with a manual transmission, a lot of the cheaper cars don't even have a tachometer. You don't shift when the engine at a certain speed. You shift when the engine at a certain sound and a certain vibrational feel that you feel through the pedals and through the steering wheel. These devices aren't a whole lot different. Once you get in tune with the device, it will tell you what you need to know. Yeah, I 100% agree. I love that analogy because I have a manual transmission vehicle and I very rarely find the need to look at the speedometer. I go almost 100% by sound. We go by sound, we go by feel. And I think as, as humans, we go by sound and go by feel a whole lot more than we really realize. We take that sensation, we take that guidance that our senses is giving us almost for granted because it's just so darn good. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, or if you don't believe me, put on some earmuffs. And I'm not talking about the ones that keep your ears from freezing. I'm talking about the ones that block out a lot of sound. And just try walking around outside. It's, it's a bit unsettling, and it's not very comfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you've ever gotten your ears like hearing tested, it's a very odd experience because you you hear your own heartbeat more than you do the things around you, and it just kind of puts you 
well, off base a little bit. It, it, it really does because now that sensory input that's just been there all the time, as when you take that out, you realize that wow, that's that's actually a really important part to me as an individual being able to navigate the world that we're in, but to also feeling like things are just right. Mm -hmm. Now, Pranav, let's take a few more questions before we wrap it up today. Yeah, uh, there was one question. Why does my cap turn black when I use a lighter, but not when I use a torch? That's a good question. And it has a whole lot to do with stoichiometry. And uh, we, we addressed this in our previous uh, Exploring the Dynaverse video as well regarding lighters. And that is, when you're combusting a fuel for the production of heat, uh, when you end up with more fuel than you have available oxygen to chemically react with that fuel and, you know, in other words, combust or uh, burn it, if you're using a hydrocarbon as your fuel source, you're going to end up creating some carbon compounds. And those carbon compounds tend to be very black and it makes your cap sooty. So if you're going to use a regular lighter, there's actually a really simple solution to get your cap from turning black, and that's bury that cap right down deep into your flame. So your flame is mostly blue, almost no yellow. It's the yellow part of the flame that tends to create the soot. Yeah, and we have videos demonstrating that as well. So we if you want to see it uh, visually demonstrated, definitely just search for uh, using the VAP cap with a Bic lighter. You'll find the video, and it's very, very helpful. And in those soft flame lighters, as long as you have a relatively wind-free environment, they actually work pretty darn good, and they're not much slower than a good torch lighter. Yeah, I, I like using the uh, big style lighters when I travel because... They're you, available. Yeah, they're available. And, you know, you can, like those, there's not as many restrictions when it comes to flying. No, you can fly with them and you can pick them up just about anywhere. Soft flame lighters work almost as good as a torch. Now, a torch won't, won't turn your cap black because the torch is using a more pressurized stream of gas to entrain the appropriate amount of air containing oxygen so that we can maintain the appropriate stoichiometry or ratio of oxidizer and fuel so that things can burn more or less completely. That doesn't happen with a soft flame. Mm -hmm. Okay, Pranav, let's take two more and then we'll announce the winner of the Instagram Solstice giveaway. So someone asked if uh, someone wants to see some inserts for the green box for the tidy space. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, and there's quite a few makers in the Dynaverse who do such things, and one of them is Cam. So if you're interested, he has some of them available for download on Thingiverse. He also has his own website, so you can check him out. I think it's Cam Casey Customs. So, yes. What else can we do? Would a plasma lighter be a good candidate? I'll answer that one. Um, not unless you like liking 9-volt batteries. Um, <laughs> It will give you a pretty nasty shock if you try using a plasma torch with a VAP cap. And and it, doesn't, it doesn't create a whole lot of heat. Yeah. So, and, and I know some of you are thinking, well, wait a minute, plasmas are really hot. And the answer is generally yes, they are very hot. But the plasma lighters, even though that plasma might be in excess of three or 4,000 degrees, there's a key difference between heat and temperature. It's hot, but it doesn't have a lot of heat. Just like a big pot of boiling water has a lot of heat, but in comparison to plasma, it's not very hot. Mm -hmm. And then Pranav, who is the lucky winner of, well, first, uh, what does the winner win? So the winner wins a wakeboard, a 2020M, and a cool Dynastash. And, and the lucky winner is Jason Davis. Congratulations. Please send your details to, who are we sending it to? JC, JC at, at Dynavap.com. And as right. we wrap, wrap things up, uh, George, do you want to talk about the art project? You know, I would love to talk about the art project. Uh, so we've been working with a, a local maker who has uh, come up with a really interesting way to not only put some really cool art onto some metal, and Pranav will kind of show you some of this. Uh, oh, now that, that is sweet. <laughs> it's transparent. <laughs> it's metal. So it's, it's metal, um, and so you get a little bit of reflectivity through it, and the 
picture and the artwork goes all the way around the edges and the corners. So it looks like a canvas, Check but it's metal. Out. So it's really nice for your garage or for other areas where you might have a little bit of wind blowing or you might have some fluctuating humidity where you wouldn't want to have like a standard canvas type of art. Uh, so real high resolution. And we're looking for other people that have really cool pictures, especially the artists that have created those pictures, to send us your artwork. And uh, if we select your artwork, we will print it on metal and send you a copy of it for free. So yeah, if you're interested, please join the Dynaverse Discord and join the discussion. Send us your artwork and we'll get working on it. So you're looking for, on the Dynaverse Discord, you're looking for the Collaborative Art Project. And Pranav, how do they get into that Discord? Uh, the link is in the chat. So perfect. And then we can also add that, uh, or as it opens up later on, we can add that to the show notes, correct? Yes, we can. Sweet. And so I think that about covers it for this week's episode of DynaVap Live. Uh, we want to thank Ben and Bryce behind the camera. Uh, we want to thank JC for handling the uh, winner giveaways. Uh, what else do we have going on, Pranav? That uh, I need to come back down to Earth. <laughs> and what about you, George? So do you cool to the click? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, this is, this is a fun space. This is a really nice space. So. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us here in this space we call the Dynaverse. Uh, let's keep it positive. Let's uh, you know, share it with the people that we care about. And if you uh, think it might be nice for your local stores or providers to carry our product, we'd appreciate you uh, kind of helping us get the word to them. And yeah, so we want to thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you in two weeks. And so we look forward to seeing you then. And that'll be July 2nd at 4.19 p.m. And that will be at Central Time. And is there anything else that you'd like to add? Uh, I don't know. Enjoy the weather. And, uh, you know, as things are opening up, let's, uh, let's kind of celebrate our freedom. I think that's a perfect thing and because we're coming right around to uh, Independence Day. Yes, we are. So we'll see you then. Thanks for watching. For more videos, click here or here, and don't forget to subscribe.